Um, you know, for 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 some of you, it it would be enough. For some of you, it might not. Uh, I would recommend, like, when you're doing the study guide, as I'm sure you've seen, a lot of the questions on tests are um, are like conceptual. So, you know, having some sort of examples or whatnot um, on there on your study guide, or at least having like referring back to your PowerPoints or whatnot with examples is definitely helpful. All right, so the um, the midterm is a uh, hundred questions uh, in seventy minutes. Okay, that is we're doing that is what the AP exam is. So that's why for people wondering why that's what it is, we're got to get used to the hundred questions. Uh, you got about forty two seconds per question. Um, if you notice on the study guide, it also has uh, it has how many questions are from each unit. That's kind of based on the uh, the breakdown of the AP exam. So you see, like the most of, most questions are from unit one, right? Uh, Twenty eight questions from unit one. That's because on the AP exam, uh, research methods makes up about sixteen percent. Or so, and um, so we're kind of trying to, you know, we're only halfway through the class, so or less than halfway through the class. All right. So the first thing we're going to start with is the are the uh, are the different approaches to psychology, or called perspectives, views, whatever you want to say. Okay, these different approaches are just, you know, as you've seen, like human behavior can be explained in a lot of different ways. And so the approaches are just different angles of explaining human behavior. Some of them are accurate, some of them are not, uh, some of them are outdated. So the earliest perspective is the psychoanalytic perspective. Uh, psychoanalytic perspective uh, founded uh, late 1800s by Sigmund Freud. Uh, the main idea behind the psychoanalytic perspective is that uh, behavior is a product of unconscious drives, uh, things going on deep within our mind that we are not aware of. We talked in this unit about repression. Repression is a Freudian concept, the idea that we push anxiety-inducing thoughts, feelings, emotions it deep into our unconscious, and then they actually like come out in certain ways. We'll talk more about that later when we get to personality. So. Kind of with key words with psychoanalytic unconscious drives. Uh, Freud was also very focused on childhood trauma, particularly what he viewed it like trauma in, in what he called the, the psychosexual stages of development that we will also talk about later on. But he said that these things that happen in childhood or these things that are unconscious can affect us throughout our whole life. Uh, behavioral perspective is a reaction to the psychoanalytic perspective uh, founded by John Watson in the 1920s, I believe, and then expanded on later on by B.F. Skinner. So these are the behaviorists. As we, as we know, the behaviorists are not concerned. Freud was all about what's going on up here. He kind of made it all up. Um, the behaviorists are not concerned about what's going on up in our mind. All right, because we can't prove it. Okay, it is not. It is subjective. I can lie to you about how I'm feeling or whatnot. So the behaviorists are all about observable behavior. Okay, that is all they were focused on, and basically believed that our behavior was simply a product of factors going on in our environment. If you think back to Little Albert, okay, Little Albert. Um, started to fear the white rats because the white rats were paired with something that he was already afraid of, which was uh, loud noises. That's an environmental factor. He said that we learn how to behave based on how our environment reacts to us, what we get back from our environment. Um, that's more of the operant conditioning um, with behavior has consequences and then those consequences shape how we behave again in the future. Um, they uh, also, the behaviorists do not believe that we have any free will. Okay, They believe that 
all of our behavior, even if we think that we are acting under our own volition, is actually we are doing it by um, doing it because of how we think the environment, what we've learned from our environment. Uh, the humanists come after that as kind of a reaction to the behaviorists. Uh, we don't need to know any names from that with the humanists yet. Uh, humanists a believe in free will. They believe that we all that how we behave is our choice. And um, humanism is very, very positive. It's very kind of uplifting. It's kind of like, a, you know, you go and do you. You got to do what's best for you. But it basically said that all of our behavior is a product of us trying to reach our full potential. Okay, so potential, growth, uh, those would be key words that would go along with the behaviorists, or sorry, with the humanists. Cognitive perspective, okay, we've been talking about one aspect of cognition in this last unit, which is memory. Cognitive perspective is just how, um, how our thought processes, how the language that we speak, how our memories, our problem-solving ability, um, our intelligence, how do all of those things influence our behavior? So basically the opposite of the behaviorist, it is all focused on what is going on up here, up in our mind. Uh, Sociocultural is looking at cultural influences on our behavior. So it is environmental, but it's different than the behaviorist. It's, a, it's basically saying that, you know, our behavior is guided and directed towards the society that we live in and also fitting in in the society we live in, but like how our heritage, how our religion, ethnicity, how our education, home life, um, all, of, all of these things. You know, if you think about with like sexuality or things like that, in certain cultures, it's accepted. And so people might be able to um, show if they're homosexual, heterosexual, they can, they're able to express that, whereas in some cultures it might not be. So that's kind of how sociocultural would come into play. Do behaviorists believe genetics influence behavior? No. Um, the behaviorists are entirely nurture. They do not believe that, Skinner did not really believe that our genetics really played much of a role in our behavior. That was all our environment. Uh, evolutionary perspective is kind of vague, but it's really just looking at how natural selection, how like certain traits are selected for an environment and we behave in ways to survive. Survival is a key word with evolution, with the evolutionary um, survival and reproduction. Okay, so how do these different adaptive traits, whether it's having a certain color hair or dressing a certain way, how might it get you to survive and reproduce? And then the biological perspective, uh, how do biological factors, unlike behaviorism, the opposite, so behaviorism is nurture, right? biological is nature. How does our, our genetics, uh, nervous system, hormones, neurotransmitters, uh, brain, you know, if we think about mental illness, uh, bio, biological psychologists look at mental illness, and, uh, like depression, as a product of low levels of serotonin, okay, or, and other biological aspects. So that's the perspectives. Uh, hindsight bias, hindsight bias, knew it all along phenomenon, uh, the idea that when we find if we find out information that is contradictory to what we previously believed, um, a lot of times we ignore what we previously believed and we just say, oh, yeah, duh, that makes sense. Because once we found that, once we find out information about something, it's obvious. Once something happens, it's obvious that it was going to happen because it happened. Uh, one of the issues with hindsight bias is it gets in the way of critical thinking. Because rather than examining and saying, why did this happen? We say, well, yep, that's obvious that that was going to happen. So uh, let's just move on. Uh, all right. So moving on to research methods. Uh, descriptive research. Descriptive research is the most basic form of research. It, it does what exactly what it sounds like. It describes. Right? We are just describing behavior, but it does not tell us why. Um, surveys, we all know what a survey is. The good thing about surveys 
is um, you can get a large sample of attitudes from a population. A okay? population is a group that we are studying, okay? the whole group. The sample is the group that is going to get the survey or whatnot. So if we want to get find out the political leanings of Charlotte, North Carolina, they could send out 500 surveys and they would get a relatively accurate picture of the political leanings of Charlotte. Uh, it's important with surveying that we get a random sample. A random sample means that every member of a population has an equal chance of being included in the, in the research. That way, if we want to find out the political leanings of Charlotte, North Carolina, but they only sample people who live in Valentine, all right, that's not going to give us a good picture of it because Valentine's probably more conservative than other areas of science. Uh, case study, another type of descriptive research. Case study, um, or you can rejoin. Yeah. Um, case study is an in-depth look at an individual, uh, at a group, at an event. Generally, we're looking at these things because there's something abnormal about it. We are looking at abnormality. So example of that would be Jeannie, uh, the girl who was locked in a room by herself from age, th age three to 13. Found out a lot about, especially about how we develop language uh, from her. And then naturalistic observations, exactly what it sounds like. If we, when we observe something in its natural environment, right, just to see how a person or an animal or whatnot acts in nature. Um, main thing with this is there cannot be any manipulation, right? So, you know, if we want to find out how guys and girls interact at a bar on Saturday night, best thing might be to just go to the bar and just watch. All right, um, correlational research, which research method cannot be recreated. Case studies cannot be recreated. Uh, correlational research. Cor correlational research can tell us if there is a relationship between variables. Okay, we can look and see, all right, if we're, let's say that we give a survey about the political attitudes of people in Charlotte and the survey says, how old are you? What is your race? What is your ethnicity, sex, age, all these things. And we find that, oh, okay. So people 60, uh, white males 65 and above um, are more likely to be, to identify as Republican. Okay, that would be a relationship between those variables. Um, the thing the correlation cannot tell us is causation, right? It does not tell us cause and effect. All we know is if there is a relationship between variables. Uh, two different types of correlations. So uh, positive correlation is a direct relationship between variables. What that means is as one goes up, the other goes up, or as one goes down, the other goes down. Okay, the more fast food you eat, the heavier you are. Okay, that would be a positive correlation. Um, negative correlations are indirect or inverse. What that means is they are they they the variables work in opposite directions. If one goes up, the other goes down. The more you run, the less you weigh. Okay. Uh, illusory correlations. Illusory correlations where, where we believe that there is a relationship between um, variables, uh, but when there is actually not one. So uh, the idea that like um, hospitals are crazier when there's a full moon. All right, a lot of times this is all just based on confirmation bias. Okay, if a hospital's crazy and it's a full moon, you're like, oh, wow. Yep, this confirms it, right, but there's not real, but if it's not crazy, it's a full moon, you don't really think of it. So an illusory correlation where we believe that there is a relationship between factors, uh, but there is not. The, uh, the last type of research method uh, is the experimental method. Right? Experiments can tell us cause and effect. All right, they're the only type of research that can tell us cause and effect. 
because the variables can be manipulated because experiments are going to be done in a controlled lab setting or something like that. So you can change things in the variables all right, and see what the effect of that change is. So different the variables. Uh, confirmation bias is not on there. I'm only going over the study guide. Um, the different the different variables okay an independent variable is the variable that is going to be manipulated in in research so that would be the cause so let's say that we're doing a drug trial um, for a new drug to treat schizophrenia and we might have a group that doesn't get any of the drug or gets a placebo we might get a group that gets 10 milligrams of it and we might get a group that have a group that gets 20 milligrams of it that's what we mean by manipulation you can give each group a different amount give each group something different and see what the effect is so the effect is the dependent variable what happens due to the manipulation okay so if they find that schizophrenic symptoms um there's no effect on schizophrenic symptoms with 10 milligrams in the, this new drug but at 20 milligrams the hallucinations stop okay that would be the dependent variable in this piece of research uh, confounding variables confounding variables are outside factors that can affect the outcome of research but they're really really hard to control for it can be some with experiments it, it's really hard to get a representative sample right you generally have to rely on volunteers and so you know you might have a certain type of person who volunteers for it and whatnot so things like age uh weight you know the example i know i gave in class is do it, do it like eating a high protein versus low protein diet the night before a race um and then seeing if there was any effect on how fast they ran confounding variables there could be age could be the amount of sleep that they got could be weight any of those things are things that are hard to control for just because people are different so yeah, i'm going to skip right here down here and then i'll come back to operational definitions because it fits better uh, so how do we do our best to control how do we limit the effect of confounding variables, random assignment. Okay, random assignment is where participants in a study, even if they're all volunteers, they have to be randomly assigned. They all have to have an equal chance of being included in any of the different groups. So if there's only a control group and an experimental group, everybody has to have a 50 50 shot. Okay. If there's a control group and two experimental groups, everybody has to have a 33% shot of being included in each one. It has to be ran, they have to be randomly assigned. We can't say, all right, we're gonna put all the black people in this group, all the white people in this group. Okay, that would not be random assignment. So random assignment helps control for and minimize the effects of confounding variables. Now, in experiments, all right, how do we uh, how do we define variables? operational definitions okay operational definitions is how will the variables be measured if we're going back to the uh difference between control and experimental control doesn't get the iv experimental gets the iv uh, if we're going back to the uh, drug for schizophrenia i we say all right what is the drug okay you have to give say exactly what it is exactly how much you're giving, what was the placebo, what, what did they use that for the placebo or whatnot. Okay, if we're talking about the protein and running one, what do we mean by protein? All right, is protein chicken? Is it, you know, whatever, uh, just a lot of avocados or anything like that. So we need these to make sure that we're being consistent because if, um, if I look at your research and I say, I don't think that that like that result doesn't seem legit. I need to do, I want to do this experiment again. All right. I need to know exactly how you measured 
your variables. Because if I measure them differently, then I'm going to get different results. And then they want to be comparable. That's called replication. All right, so finally, double blind studies. Okay, double blind means that um, neither the, this mostly applies to like medical study uh, with medicine and stuff like that. Neither the participant or the experimenter knows who is in the control group or the experimental group. The reason we do this is to eliminate bias. If an experimenter knows that, oh, this group, this person right here is only getting the placebo, but they're reporting lessening of schizophrenic symptoms, the experimenter might say, well, then that's, that's nonsense. They got the placebo, so that doesn't count. Um, we don't want the participants to know either because if you're in the group that gets the placebo, right? If you know you're getting a placebo, it's not a placebo anymore, okay? Because the placebo, the placebo is the expectation of what's going to happen. If you don't expect anything to happen from it, then really nothing's going to happen, okay? So that's why we need to use double blind, especially in those scenarios. Uh, and then finally, ethical principles in research. Uh, no coercion, meaning you can't be forced to participate or stay. Uh, all these came out after two studies uh, that were done in the 60s and 70s. First, Milgram's study on obedience. And then secondly, uh, Zimbardo's uh, Stanford Prison study. Um, can't be uh, forced to stay. You have to have informed consent. Informed consent means you are, have been explained what the purpose of the research is and you agree to it. You've been informed and you consent to doing it. Uh, sometimes though, we have to use deception. Okay, we have to lie to the participants because if you don't, then the research won't work. If in Milgram's study, if they knew that it was a study on obedience, they wouldn't obey. They'd, they'd be like, well, I'm not gonna obey. Okay, so they told him it was a study on learning and memory. If we use, so deception can be used if the benefits outweigh the costs. Um, if we use deception, we have to debrief, meaning right afterwards, we have to explain, hey, we lied to you. This is actually what the study was about, okay? Because like in Milgram's study, they didn't debrief them and people left thinking that they could have possibly hurt or killed somebody. So we got to debrief. Uh, anonymity, anonymity means like if, if the participants are supposed to be anonymous, Let's say it's a, just like a survey. Um, the researcher can't do anything to try to find out the identity of them. They can't put identifying questions in there or anything like that. Confidentiality means if the researchers, if the research is not anonymous, let's say that I'm doing interviews with people about you know drug use at Ardry Kell, okay, and I'm and I'm meeting with people in person, I can't then say like, oh, well, I'm gonna go tell everybody what you said. If it's not anonymous, the, the researcher, the participants have to be kept confidential. And then, uh, and then finally, protection from harm. Uh, shouldn't have any unnecessary discomfort. I uh, can have a little bit, but nothing unnecessary. So there's research method. All right, moving on to the biological basis of behavior. Got 23 questions on that. Uh, neurotransmitters, okay? I didn't put all of them on here because I just didn't have room. You all can do that yourself. But uh, what do specific ones do? And what happens when it's too much or too little? The three I put on here, okay, serotonin, the main thing to associate with that is mood. Uh, and then too little serotonin has been associated with depression. Um, acetylcholine, uh, memory formation and uh, storage, and then and muscle movement. Uh, too little or lack of functioning in these neurons has been associated with Alzheimer's disease, also with things like multiple sclerosis. And then uh, dopamine. Dopamine plays a, a big role in learning, attention, motivation, focus. Uh, all those things. Um, too much dopamine has been associated with the uh, uh, hallucinatory symptoms of schizophrenia. And too little 
has been associated with Parkinson's disease, uh, which is where they get muscle tremors. There's also a muscle component with dopamine, but associated muscle movement with acetylcholine. Uh, there are, what does schizophrenia mean? It's a, a mental disorder, psychological disorder. All right, there are four other ones, but you can do those on your own. All right, neural communication, okay? Uh, how do neurons communicate with each other? So first off, the, uh, the parts of a neuron. Um, if we're looking at a neuron going from left to right, let me see if I can pull up a picture of a neuron. That's too many pictures on there. All right, so um, if we're going from left to right, okay, so cell body or soma is just where the nucleus and all that sort of stuff is, the regular cell. Uh, that's kind of, that's the control center of the neuron. Coming off of the cell body here, what are called dendrites. Uh, dendrites are like branches, dendro means tree. Um, the dendrites, are there to they receive um, the chemical signals in the form of neurotransmitters from the other neuron from the what's called the presynaptic neuron or the firing neuron um so you know we get neurotransmitters bind to the receptor sites on the dendrites right that then triggers action potential all right, which starts right about here, what's called the axon hillock. Yeah, cell body is another term for soma, correct. Yep. Um, and then coming off of the cell body here is a, a wire, a wire-like structure okay, called the axon. The axon is what the, um, thank you, buddy. Yep. the axon is what the electrical signal, the action potential travels down. Think of it like the wire of an iPhone cord. Uh, covering. The axon for protection right here are what are called my, the myelin sheath. Myelin sheath is fatty tissue that covers it for protection. Um, it nourishes it and also it helps speed up neural transmission. When the myelin sheath starts to deteriorate, the electrical signal uh, can die. That's where diseases like multiple sclerosis come from, where you lose muscle control. Um, at the, and then finally, the, at the end of the axon, the axon branches off, okay, it splits off, just like if you were to unwi unwind a wire, all right, into what are called axon terminals or terminal buttons, which are the ends of the axon. Okay, the terminal buttons are what contain the chemical, uh, the chemical messengers, uh, the neurotransmitters. So... The electrical signal travels down the axon to the axon terminal, right, and then release it, and then that triggers the release of neurotransmitters into the synaptic gap, which is the gap in between axon terminal and dendrite. They then travel across, like here, travel from here over to here, okay, and bind at that, that, at that receiving postsynaptic dendrite, and then the whole process starts again. So, um, as I said, action potential. If the neural threshold is met, okay, so neuro, uh, ne uh, neurotransmitters bind at the receptor sites on dendrites. If the chemical signal from the neurotransmitter is strong enough, it hits what is called the threshold, it's usually negative 55 millivolts, um, that triggers, the cell starts to depolarize, all right, and that triggers the electrical signal, the chemical reaction triggers the electrical signal. That electrical signal then travels down the axon. This electrical signal is called, is referred to as an all or none response. Um, a neuron either fires or it doesn't. Okay, if it reaches the threshold, which is the minimum stimulation, there will be an action potential. 
if it doesn't reach the threshold, it will not fire, and therefore that neuron will not be not communicate the signal to any other neuron. Um, so what happens after after the neurotransmitters are released from the axon terminal? They they travel into the synaptic gap. All right, travel into the synaptic gap here. They bind. A lot of times, though, there is excess. So neurotransmitters kind of, they travel in little boats called vesicles. Um, they, well, these vesicles bind, their chemical signal triggers it, and then they're released back into the synapse. There's also usually excess neurotransmitter. It's just kind of chilling uh, in between. Um, these, the neurotransmitters belong to the neuron that they came from. And so the neuro, that axon terminal doesn't want to waste it. So they, they're then after they fire, there's a process called reuptake. Reuptake is when the excess neurotransmitters and the empty vesicles travel back to where they came from to be repackaged, recycled, and used again. That's when the refractory period happens, uh, when a neuron cannot fire. Um, communication within a neuron. Okay, so just now, this is a question we get asked. You get asked a lot. Communication within a neuron is electrical. Communication between neurons is chemical. The electrical is the action potential. The chemical is the neurotransmitter. All right, moving on to types of neurons. Okay, uh, two types of neurons that we need to know that are in the peripheral nervous system. Okay, these are in the peripheral, meaning in the nerves that come off of the spinal cord. Uh, they're afferent neurons, which are sensory, which send signals from the body up to the brain. And then there are motor neurons, which are also called efferent, which send movement signals from the brain or from the spinal cord uh, out to the body, telling body parts to move. But you can remember this is the mnemonic same sensory afferent motor efferent okay all right so um the so the central nervous system central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord okay just like center now the peripheral nervous system is all of the nerves that extend off of the spinal cord all right, that extend out to the limbs of your body, ex, uh, ex, um, extend to your um, uh, organs, things like that. Which one is outgoing and which one is ingoing? Well, sensory is ingoing, motor is outgoing. Motor means movement, so it's sending its signals out. Uh, there are two, type, two parts of the peripheral nervous system. Somatic nervous system is a uh, voluntary muscle movement okay so anything that we do that writing is the somatic nervous system autonomic nervous system is uh involuntary body functions so the autonomic nervous system is involved in digestion controlling heart rate uh sweating saliva uh, all of those different things two parts of the autonomic nervous system Sympathetic is our fight or flight system. So both of these are kind of working together. They both kind of keep us at what's called homeostasis or at balance. Uh, sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. Stressful situations, excited or whatnot, sympathetic kicks in. Sympathetic's gonna increase your heart rate, it's gonna dilate your pupils to get more light in. Uh, it's going to decrease saliva production. It's going to decrease digestion, save energy. All right. Once your body is what is going back to a resting state, that is the parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system also called uh, called rest and digest. Okay, it's calming. Um, it's what kind of keeps us down at homeostasis. We don't want we don't want our sympathetic nervous system activated all the time. That leads to high blood pressure, high level of stress, things like that. All right, uh, brain imaging, brain imaging techniques. So biggest thing with these is knowing keywords 
and then whether they look at structure or function. Uh, MRI, MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. Okay, um, keyword there is magnetic. MRIs are looking at structure. They can take really detailed cuts, like pictures of cuts of the brain. CT scan, which is the most outdated. Uh, they also look at structure, but just not as much detail. Um, key one, keyword there is X-ray. CT stands for computed tomography. Uh, tomography means math. EEG, electroencephalogram. Keyword is electrical or electrode or electrical activity. They are looking at function, particularly function of the cerebral cortex. Okay, the EEG is the thing where they put you have the wires attached to your head, all right, and what they do is they can listen to the neurons talking to each other and they can measure brain waves. Does the first one say MRI? It does. PET scan, positron emission tomography. Um, this is also looking at function. Uh, the key word with the PET scan is glucose or radioactive glucose. What the PET scan does is they inject a basically like a, um, a radioactive highlighter fluid uh, into your, so that it travels to your brain. It's glucose, what the brain uses for energy. And then they'll give you like a little task to do and they can see where the glucose travels to. So they can see what areas of the brain are being used, therefore looking at function. Finally, fMRI. fMRIs look at structure and function. They measure function by, 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 using, by looking at blood oxygen levels through magnetic resonance. The magnets can pick up, because our blood has iron in it, uh, the magnets can pick up movement of blood. Uh, it can also give us a picture of the brain. So fMRI is the most detailed. It tells us structure and function. All right, and then uh, different parts of the brain. Okay, the hindbrain. Uh, hindbrain is consists of the brain stem and the cerebellum. The medulla. Medulla is at the base of the brain stem or the top of the spinal cord, however you want to look at it. Uh, medulla, heartbeat, breathing, things like that. If your medulla is damaged, you're going to die. Okay, it is survival function. Um, your pons, which sits on top of that, is the uh, is facial movement. Okay, the pons, uh, the what are called the um, the cranial nerves, come off of the pons and extend to the face. So tongue movement, mouth movement, just facial movement in general, uh, and then also uh, regulation of sleep and dreaming. And also the pons blocks motor signals. Uh, from going down to your body when you are dreaming, which is why we're paralyzed when we are when we're dreaming. Uh, and then the reticular formation, a uh, whole group of neurons involved in arousal and alertness. Okay, this is what wakes us up. If it's damaged, you go into a coma. Uh, cerebellum, which sits behind the brain stem back here. Cerebellum, little brain uh, balance and movement and coordinating movement, classical con classically conditioned. Uh, behaviors, things like that. So the um, moving up into the forebrain, the limbic system. Limbic system is a group of structures that surround the thalamus. Kind of, they're on both. They're in both hemispheres of the brain. They're kind of like a horseshoe that come around. Uh, the hypothalamus may be the most important uh, structure in the brain. Hypothalamus is involved in drives. Uh, regulating homeostasis, the four Fs, right, which are feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating. Which one enters a coma of damage? Reticular formation. Okay. Um, and then the hypothalamus also regulates the endocrine system uh, through the controlling the pituitary gland, the master gland. Hippocampus, which we've talked about a lot this unit, is memory formation. It sends memories out to where they are stored, and then helps us, and then helps retrieve explicit memories. Uh, the amygdala is basic emotions, okay, uh, unlearned, survive, uh, fear, and anger. All right, now moving out 
moving out to the outside layer of the brain, the lobes of the brain, which the outside, let me pull up a picture. So uh, outside layer of the brain, the whole thing is called the cerebral cortex. Okay, the cerebral cortex is the outer layer of white matter. Uh, the cerebral cortex, each hemisphere, you know, we have the right and the left hemisphere. Each hemisphere is split into four different lobes by their general functioning. It's kind of haphazard at some parts, but um, some parts you know, the general functioning. So frontal lobe right here, um, this area right up in the front is the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is decision-making, judgment, planning, personality. That's what kind of develops uh, by the time we're late teens, early 20s. Sitting on the back edge of the frontal lobe right here is the motor cortex. The motor cortex controls uh, different areas of the body are represented on it. Motor cortex sends motor or, mo or movement signals out down the spine, out to motor neurons, telling what area of the, what area of the body to move. Um, moving back here to the parietal lobe, which sits right at kind of the top of the head, the crown. Uh, most of the parietal lobe is made up of association area which is just perception, just links information, um, but sitting right here. So motor cortex is right here. Sitting right here is the somatosensory cortex. Somatosensory cortex is touch, right? Different areas of the body represented a different areas of that. More sensitive areas of the body have a larger representation on the somatosensory cortex. The back, the occipital lobe, all right, right back here is the visual cortex. This is where we process vision. And then on the sides, by the ears or by the temples, is the temporal lobe, temporal lobes. Main thing is the auditory cortex, all right, which is where we uh, process hearing. Or smell processed olfactory bulb, which is below the, it's not really in a lobe, I guess, but it's below the frontal lobe. Um, in uh, in the temporal lobe, or in the temporal lobe, we have Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is language comprehend the area that deals with language comprehension. Um, and aphasia is any sort of impairment of language comprehension. People with Wernicke's aphasia can speak perfectly fine, but they don't understand anything. Okay, they don't understand. They are not able to comprehend language right, to differing degrees, uh, can't comprehend, and their language is not meaningful. Um, one thing about language, left hemisphere. Just remember, language, left. Okay, Braca and Wernicke's area, Braca's area right about here in the frontal lobe, the left frontal lobe connected to the motor cortex. Braca's area is the physical production of speech. Wernicke's area right about here connected to the auditory cortex, that is language comprehension. All right, moving on into consciousness, sleep. Uh, sleep, circadian rhythm our 24-hour sleep-wake biological cycle, okay? If this is, you know, if we, what time do we naturally wake up? What time should we naturally go to sleep? When do you usually have a bowel movement? We get sleepy usually mid-afternoon. We're at our most alert by around 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, all these things. That is all part of the circadian rhythm. Uh, it is regulated by the hypothalamus, part of the hypothalamus, called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which responds to light. That is part where, uh, like, when it starts to get dark, it starts the suprachiasmatic nucleus, triggers the release of melatonin. 
Um, stages of sleep, okay? We have four different stages that we go through. So each sleep cycle lasts around 90 minutes, okay? So we cycle through, we go through these four stages in around 90 minutes. Uh, so we'll do that, you know, if we sleep for six hours, we'll do that roughly, um, roughly four, we'll go through these roughly four times a night. Stage one, which is light sleep. Uh, this is where you see what are called theta waves. Uh, main thing to remember with stage one is hypnagogic hallucinations. Hypnagogic hallucinations are kind of the weird uh, hallucinatory things that happen when you're falling asleep. Hypnagogic jerks, where all of a sudden your body, your muscles just contract and you wake up. Stage two, so stage one is pretty quick. 10 minutes or so stage two also pretty quick at least when we're falling asleep um a little bit deeper than stage one main thing to remember about stage two is the presence of sleep spindles which are these bursts of neural activity they're associated i believe with sleep talking but i could be wrong about that um and then finally stage three uh stage three is deep sleep Deep sleep, we see what are called delta waves. Delta waves are slow waves. They're big and slow, high amplitude, low frequency. Um, main thing with this is uh, parasom what are called parasomnias, sleepwalking, sleep talking, uh, night tears, bedwetting, things like that. As the night goes on, all right, we get most of our deep sleep early on in the night. As the night goes on, we get less and less. So what happens then, we go from stage one to stage two to stage three, and then we cycle back through those really quickly. We go back to two, one, and then instead of waking up, usually we'll, we will go into REM sleep or rapid eye movement. Rapid eye movement, um, what's interesting about rapid eye movement is A, our eyes are moving really fast, B, our brain looks like it's awake. Okay, it's called paradoxical sleep. Uh, main thing to associate with REM sleep is dreaming. Uh, also, sleep, this is where we experience sleep paralysis. So, all right, um, sleep disorders, mostly in, uh, well, some are in stage four. Insomnia, uh, persistent inability to fall asleep or to stay asleep. Narcolepsy is the opposite, where pe people with narcolepsy experience what are called sleep attacks which is where they can just fall asleep randomly. Uh, a lot of times it's due to beta alpha waves is when you're awake. Um, narcolepsy, uh, fall asleep randomly, sometimes when they get excited, whatnot. Uh, night tears are a stage three disorder where uh, usually in children where they look like they are uh, awake, um, and they also they may be screaming, running around, blah blah blah, uh, whatnot. Uh, but they are actually asleep. And then sleep apnea, which is when we um, stop breathing uh, while we are sleeping. Okay, it's most common in people that are overweight. Snoring is a sign of it. We'll stop breathing sometimes hundreds of times throughout the night. Uh, that it's bad for bad for blood pressure and whatnot. All right, give me one sec. All right, give me one sec and I'll be back.
Okay, so that is it for unit two and unit 2.5. Uh, moving on to unit three, sensation and perception, only 16 questions uh, from this unit. S&P is not um, particularly important, only is about five to 7% of the AP exam. All right, so a couple of things, difference between sensation and perception, okay? Sensation is all, all of the sensory information. You know, we talked in this unit about sensory memory, which is the momentary holding cell for all sensory information. Sensation is just everything coming in, everything, touch, smell, sound, okay, all those things uh, coming in through our, what are called sensory receptors. Um, it is what I, it is objective meaning it's, it's just the information, the electrical signals that are traveling up to our brain. Uh, perception, however, is our interpretation of these sensations, okay? Interpretation of the sensory information coming in. Uh, that's why, you know, a smell that is nice to you might be disgusting to me, all right? Even though we're both smelling the same thing, um, our perception of it is different. So, uh, two very important concepts, bottom-up versus top-down processing. Uh, bottom-up, also called feature detection. Uh, bottom-up is where we build perceptions from the bottom-up, meaning we start with just basic features, and then we build up our perception of the thing. I always, it, it's like what we, what we would use in like new experiences. Meeting somebody that you've never met before, you form a perception of them. That's bottom-up processing. Top-down processing, which is what, um, what we do most of the time, is where our perceptions are guided by our expectations, um, by prior experience, prior knowledge, uh, things like that. Okay, so, you know, if... For the students that are in my class, right, you don't come into class every day being like, I don't know what's going to go on today. Like you have kind of an expectation of like what my class is going to be like each day. OK, that would be using top down processing. So it's expectations like stereotypes are an example of top down processing. Top down processing is the most important concept in the entire class. All right, process of vision. One of the most boring things in this entire class, I think. Um, make sure that you just know the step-by-step -step process of light entering the eye. So, here's a good picture. So light enters through the outside layer, the cornea, okay, and then comes into the eye through the pupil, which is the little black dot. The pupil is regulated, is dilated or contracted uh, by the iris, which is the colored portion around it, which is a muscle. Um, light then travels through uh, the, what kind of looks like a contact lens behind the pupil, what is called the lens. The lens does a process called accommodation. Accommodation is the process of the lens changing shape and thickness based on how far away something is. So when you have to focus from close to far away, right, and stuff gets blurry, stuff is blurry far, far away, and then it's clear far away, but blurry up close, that's the lens accommodating. Light then enters the inside of this is called the vitreous humor. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, and then comes back and hits the light sensitive back surface of the eye called the retina. Uh, what we are focused on, what, whatever we are focused on, that light hits the point of central focus, what is called the fovea. Okay? The fovea is where we have, uh, we have all of our cones. Right? Fovea is where our vision is clearest. All around that in the periphery of the retina, all right, are the rods. Rods, so cones are color, detail, light, things like that. 
rods allow us to see in black and white. They allow for us to have night vision, peripheral vision, all right, but they do not pick up color in detail. That process that when the light hits the rods and cones, what are these are called photoreceptors. These photoreceptors then trigger through transduction a neural message in type of cells called bipolar cells. Neural message originates in the bipolar cells. The bipolar cells then communicate with the ganglion cells. The action potentials travel down the ganglion cells and the ganglion cells make up the optic nerve. The optic nerve then travels um, to the, through the thalamus, I forgot to put thalamus on here, okay, through the thalamus to the visual cortex, and then that's how we see. Do we need to know where they are located? You need to know the rods are in the periphery and cones are in the fovea. Okay. All right, uh, theories of color vision, two theories, opponent process. Opponent process says that in our optic nerve, we have neurons that are either sensitive to red light signals or green light signals or blue light signals or yellow light signals or black or white and when one is one is activated the other one is shut off all right so that's where we get after images if you look at a uh, red white and blue american flag and then switch it over to a white screen you will see green yellow and black uh, trichromatic theory says that in our fovea, we have three different types of cones that are sensitive to different wavelengths. They are ones that are sensitive to green wavelength, uh, red wavelength, and blue. And, um, and so they are activated at different differing levels, and then those produce, those trigger the neurons to send the signal to the brain. Color blindness does fall into uh, trichromatic theory. It could be either red blind, green blind, blue blind, or red green, or yeah. Okay. All right, process of hearing. So let's get a diagram of the ear. So sound waves enter, all right, this outside part's called the pinna, you don't need to worry about that. Enter through the auditory canal, or the ear canal, all right, sound waves then vibrate the eardrum, um, which is also called the tympanic membrane. So this is the outer ear, this is the middle ear. Uh, that vibration, then the eardrum magnifies the vibration, just think like the head of a drum, hitting the head of a drum, that vibration then um, causes these three bones, the stirrup, the anvil, or the, and the hammer, also called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, or just the bones of the middle ear. These vibrate, that vibration then travels down into the cochlea, with a little hole right there called the oval window that it travels through. Inside of the cochlea, the inside surface is called the basilar membrane. The cochlea is filled with fluid. That fluid vibrates. That vibration bends hair cells in the basilar membrane. The bending of those hair cells is what triggers the neural impulse in the auditory nerve, all right? And then that travels to the auditory cortex. Uh, hearing loss. Uh, two types of hearing loss. Conduction hearing loss is due to damage to the middle ear, either to damage that's just usually from wear and tear, it happens when you get older, uh, or damage to the eardrum or the bones is what a hearing aid would be used for. Um, and then sensory neural hearing loss, generally caused by loud noises, um, is damage to the hair cells in the cochlea. They die. Um, they can no longer transmit the neural message. This is where we would get a cochlear implant something that worked to activate, that communicates with the uh, auditory nerve. Uh, all right, vestibular sense. Vestibular sense is balance, okay? The, our balance is located in, right up here, above the bones, what are called the semicircular canals, which are these um, 
little tubes that are filled with liquid, right? The liquid moves around it. This is why if you spin around in a chair and then you stop, it still feels like you're spinning because that liquid's still moving. Um, and then those communicate with the cerebellum in the brain. All right, so what do we notice? What do we don't? Okay, what we don't. Okay, so um, selective attention, the idea that we are only aware of a small amount of what goes on around us, what we are focused on. Um, absolute threshold. Absolute threshold is the minimum level of a sensory stimulus that we are able to detect. Okay, so how weak of a light are our eyes able to pick up? How strong does the light have to be, or what is the minimum amount of light for there to for the light to trigger an action potential to reach the threshold to trigger an action potential to be sent back to the occipital lobe? Um, and then difference threshold is the smallest amount of change or smallest percentage of change in a stimulus that we are able to notice. Um, the, it is, is governed by what is called Weber's law or the just noticeable difference. Weber's law says that this is based on a constant percentage. So I can't remember the exact percentages, but for us to like, for us to notice, I think with like light, for us to notice something's gotten, gotten brighter or darker, it has to get brighter or darker by I think 8%. Okay, so that is then the minimum is the J and D or the just noticeable difference. All right, uh, Gestalt, Gestalt grouping principles. Uh, proximity, proximity is we tend to group things that are close to one another together. Continuity, uh, we see things as being continuous, uh, like lines, even if they are not. Closure is we fill in the gaps. Similarity is we group things together that are similar. Another uh, group of Gestalt principle is figure ground. Figure ground is basically figure is just what we are focused on. Ground is the background, what stands out from the background. So if we're looking at this picture I drew right here and we're looking at this guy right here, he would be the figure. Everything else would be the background. If you're listening to me right now. My voice is the figure. Any noise going on in the background behind you is the background. Uh, depth perception. Uh, monocular cues are uh, depth cues in which we only need one eye for. Okay, they are environmental, like you can look these up, but like relative height. Relative height is a monocular cue. Like we can, when we look at this picture, we can tell that this tree is further away than this person because it is higher in our visual field. You can still tell that with only one eye. They are environmental. Binocular cues. Binocular cues are biological. Okay, they rely on two eyes and our two eyes, what happens is our two eyes, our two retinas see slightly different images and then our brain compares them. The larger the difference in the images, the closer something is to us. You can do that by just putting your finger up in front of your face and opening and closing one eye, one eye, one eye after the other, you'll notice that your finger moves. Okay, that is, called retinal, that is called retinal disparity. The difference in the two images. Sensory adaptation, uh, just the idea that when our sensory receptors, whether it's smell, taste, touch, when they are is retinal disparity why some smartphones have multiple cameras? Yes, I think so, yeah. Um, sensory adaptation, when our sensory receptors, whether it is our photoreceptors in our eye or our olfactory receptors in our nose or our proprioceptors, our nociceptors, which are propane, once they are constantly stimulated, they'll eventually be like, all right, screw it, I'm not paying attention to this anymore. And so they will stop responding. Um, and so the signal won't be sent to the brain anymore. This is why everybody else's house smells weird, but your house doesn't smell weird. Your nose, you call it your nose blind to it. Your nose has stopped responding to the smell in your house.
Okay. All right. Uh, and then finally, perceptual set. Uh, perceptual set is where we are predisposed to perceive one thing over another thing. So if I show you an, ambig an ambiguous picture and well, something that might be like a monster in the water, and I say this is the Loch Ness monster, you're more likely to see to see it. If I tell you that if you listen to the to the Beatles song Revolution Nine backwards, there's a satanic message in it. You're more likely to hear it. All right. Um, priming is an example of this. All right. So we're going to go over unit four learning. There are only 17 questions on that. And then uh, unit five, you all can, we just had a test on that. So that should be pretty straightforward. So, all right. So unit four was learning. Okay. Uh, learning is the persistence um, of memory over time, okay? Different types of learning. There's asso associative learning is what we spend most of the time talking about. Uh, associative learning is where we learn to associate two events with one another. We either learn that one event predicts another one, which, it, which would be classical conditioning, or we learn that a behavior has a consequence. All right, that would be operant conditioning. So we learn the association between these things. Uh, some names you need to know uh, for this unit. Unit's a big name unit. John Watson, the father of behaviorism. Albert Bandura is the father of, so of social cognitive learning uh, or observational learning. He's the one who did the Bobo doll experiment with modeling. And then B.F. Skinner is kind of the second father of behaviorism. He comes along after Watson. Watson is more focused on classical conditioning. Um, Skinner is more focused, is operant conditioning, learning how behaviors have consequences. Okay, um, so uh, make sure you know the process of, of classical conditioning all right, and what the different terms are. Um, so on my study guide, I use the example of Pavlov's dog. Um, as we know, Pavlov's dog was the dog. What's the difference between classical and operant? I just went over that, okay? Classical is linking an event, is linking two unrelated events. Operant is behavior and consequence. Um, so with, Pav with Pavlov's dog, uh, as you know, the, do uh, the dog started to respond. Um, the dog learned that the sound of a bell predicted food, and so the dog started to salivate at the sound of a bell. Um, so with classical conditioning, we have to start with something that is innate first, meaning unlearned. Classical conditioning is implicit, okay? It is, un is unconscious for the most part. Um, so that's where we start with the un an unconditioned stimulus, um, which causes an unconditioned response, okay? This is unlearned. In Pavlov's experiment, the unconditioned stimulus was food and the unconditioned response to the food was salivation. That is innate, that happens naturally, there's no learning involved there. So for classical conditioning to occur, we have to introduce something before the unconditioned stimulus that we learn predicts the unconditioned stimulus. In Pavlov's experiment, it was a bell. He would ring a bell and then he would give the dog food and the dog would then salivate at the food, okay? After a while, the dog learns to link the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus. So the unconditioned stimulus, or sorry, the neutral stimulus, the bell, starts to predict food. 
once we know that learning, we know that learning has occurred when the bell pauses the previously unconditioned response. When the bell causes salivation, that is when we know learning has occurred. At that point, the neutral stimulus has become the conditioned stimulus, okay? And the unconditioned response has become the conditioned response. So make sure you know that. Um, all right, some terms we need to know, particularly applying to, uh, to classical conditioning. Generalization, okay? Generalization is when we start to respond to um, uh, conditioned stimuli that are similar to the, to the original conditioned stimulus. Pavlov's dog started to respond to really anything that sounded like a bell, a metronome, uh, a little um, ballerina thing, anything that sounded like a bell, they would salivate to. Generalization. Discrimination is the opposite of that. Discrimination, when there's only one specific condition stimulus. If you get food poisoning from Benny's pizza, but you will, but you still eat any, you, if you avoid Benny's pizza, but you still eat any other pizza, that's discriminating. That is a, Benny's pizza would be a discriminative condition stimulus. Uh, and then finally, extinction. If the condition stimulus no longer predicts the unconditioned stimulus, meaning if after a while, if the dog does not get food after the bell, right, that response will go away. Okay, that is called extinction. All right, operant conditioning, B.F. Skinner. All right, learning that behavior has consequences, right? And those consequences, in the, in, the ter in the purpose of this class, consequence means anything that comes after a behavior, all right? Those consequences either serve to increase or maintain a behavior or decrease, or stop a behavior. Um, anything that is meant to increase a behavior. Anything that comes after a behavior that serves to make that behavior continue is called reinforcement. There's positive reinforcement, which is where you get something good, all right? You gain something that you like following a behavior. You get a question right up, you get a question right, and you get a lollipop. It's the addition of something good. Negative reinforcement is the removal of something that is unpleasant that will serve to increase the behavior, such as you get a question right. You get, let's say you get a, you get above an, you get a ninety or above on the midterm, and you don't have to do any homework for the rest of the for the rest of the second semester. Okay, that would be negative reinforcement, it's taking away something unpleasant, which is homework. Um. Punishment, on the other hand, is anything, any consequence that serves to decrease the likelihood of a behavior. Um, positive punishment is getting something unpleasant following a behavior that should decrease it. Okay, you talk back to your parents and you get slapped. Uh, getting slapped is positive punishment. Negative punishment is the removal of something that you like that is meant to decrease the behavior. You get caught sneaking out of the house and your parents take your phone away, all right? You like your phone, so that is meant to decrease that behavior. It's taking away something good. All right, uh, continuous reinforcement. Continuous reinforcement is when a behavior is reinforced every single time um, every single time it is done. Okay, um, continuous reinforcement is the most effective when we're trying to teach something, all right, because it, it's, you quickly learn the association between behavior and consequence, um, but it is also the most likely to go extinct if the, um, if the stimulus is, um, uh, 
if they if you stop getting the reinforcement after the behavior, all right, then the behavior will go extinct. All right, and then uh, let's see schedules. Schedules of reinforcement. What B.S. Skinner studied. Uh, schedules of reinforcement just refer to when do we get the reinforcement? What is the pattern in which we get reinforcement? Uh, there are four different types of schedules. All right, a fixed schedule is set. A variable schedule is random or unpredictable. All right. A ratio schedule is based on the is based on the number of behaviors that are exhibited. An interval schedule is based on a length of time passing. So a fixed ratio schedule is when the reward comes after a set number of behaviors. For every five A's you get on tests your parents give you $50, okay? So you know when the reward is coming. A variable ratio schedule is when the reward comes after an unpredictable or average number of a behavior. Shooting a basketball, okay? You don't hit, you don't make, make a shot every single time, all right? But every once in a while you do. Okay, so the reward comes after at an uh, unpredictable rate, but it's still based on your behavior. Fixed interval is where the reward is um, after a set length of time. So if you're cook baking something in the oven, you know exactly when that's going to be done. That's a fixed interval schedule, but you have no control over it. Um, and then a variable interval schedule. Okay, is where the reward comes after a random length of time. This is like checking your phone for text messages. Okay, you just check it at a kind of a you know a regular rate because you don't know when you're going to get a text message, but you have no control over getting it. So it's after a length of time. Uh, variable ratio, most resistant to extinction. Because it's random, we like randomness, but we are also in control of it. All right, last couple things. Um, primary, different types of reinforcers. Primary reinforcers are things that are innately reinforcing because they are they fulfill biological needs. Food is a is a primary reinforcer. Sleep, the primary reinforcer. Uh, water, affiliation, uh, sex. Okay, all of those warmth, all of these are primary reinforcers. They fulfill biological needs. Um, conditioned or secondary reinforcers are reinforcers that are learned, um, partially because we um, the a lot of times secondary reinforcers are things that allow for us to get our primary needs met, like money. Money is a condition, it's called a generalized, but it's also conditioned. Um, but it could also be things like, you know, dressing nice and getting a compliment, okay? You learn these things. Okay, shaping uh, operant conditioning technique, where um, you try, if you're trying to reach a desired behavior, um, it, and it might be a more complex behavior, like your dog, like tr playing dead. You can't just teach it to play dead. You have to teach it in small steps, baby steps, what are called successive approximations. Um, and you reinforce, um, you re reinforce each step. Okay, you reinforce the step, and then. Um, once they learn that, you stop reinforcing and you reinforce the next step. Okay. All right. And then finally, uh, two other types of learning that they kind of go against associative learning, but we don't, we're just going to, insight learning is the aha moment, okay, where uh, the solution to a problem just comes to you. Right. And then lastly, um, uh, latent, well, latent learning, 
latent learning is a type of learning where we don't really know that we know something until there is some sort of reward for it. So like trivia, but cognitive maps are an example of this. A cognitive map is the idea, we form a mental image of whatever environment we are in um, so that we get implicit, it's automatic, okay? So that we can find our way around the next time that we're there. Famous study done on this by Edward Tolman where they had rats um, wander around a maze with no reward. Once there was a reward at the end of the maze, the rats that had just been given free reign in the maze um, were able to find their way to the end faster than the rats who had never been in the maze before, which showed that the rats had learned the, um, the layout of the maze, even though they didn't really have any reason to learn. So, That is it. As I said, you can do memory on your own since we just had a test on that.